Welcome to our program in a nutshell. I'm Bob Savakanis. Today we have two very special guests who have traveled all the way from Florida to visit us here in northeastern Pennsylvania to talk about filmmaking and to talk about what great opportunities we have in northeastern Pennsylvania to showcase all of our great attractions, what a great community it is. And so I want to welcome our guests today. First we have Ed McKeever. Ed is formerly from New Jersey. He ran a security company um, in Atlantic City. He coasted and took care of many celebrities in the area. Um, he's recently moved to the Florida area to start a company called Showtown American Pictures. Also with him is his, is his son, Michael McKeever, and Michael is, aspires to be an attorney. He's currently in high school in Florida now, and he's also an actor. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that's all about in just the next couple of minutes. So welcome, Michael, and welcome, Ed, to our program. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Well, first of all, what brought you to Northeastern Pennsylvania this, this weekend in August? Well, we came here to premiere our brand new film, The Beast Comes at Midnight, which is a, uh, a family-friendly monster movie, uh, a classic creature feature, stars Eric Roberts, Michael Pere, and of course, Michael, Madeline Cimento, Kyle Oifer, Dylan Intriago, and Samantha O'Donnell. And you can't forget um, Joe Castro, who's a... Uh, special effects wizard from Hollywood. Just real great people involved in this. So I know a couple of days ago we spent some time in New York City. Why were we in New York City with this film, The Beast Comes at Midnight? We were in New York City because we actually showed this film at the Regal UA as a part of the Festival of Cinema, New York City. Uh, great event, had a nice turnout, some great people there, a lot of fun, very interesting, and more importantly, it was well received by the crowd. People really enjoyed the the uh, campy creature feature-ness uh, of it, and um, the fact that it's something you can watch with the whole family. Still has some scares, some chills, some thrills, some good acting, um, and, and I think just overall enjoyed by everyone. So Michael, let's talk a little bit about your role in the movie The Beast Comes at Midnight. Tell our audience a little bit about what it's like to be 14 years old, to be a 14-year-old actor. I mean, it was just amazing. I, I, loved, I loved everything about it. I always loved film, so the fact that I can you know, just be a lead in this one is just amazing. And you also were in another film that your dad was involved with. you want to tell us a little bit about that movie? Sure, yeah. That was my first feature film. It's called 100 Acres of Hell. I had a small role where I was like a fanboy for the main character who's played by Gene Snitsky. So, you know, I have a little interaction with him there. And that's really what kicked off my career so far. Well, as our audience knows, I've been doing a lot of documentary work through the years. Um, Rocky Glen Park was probably my most famous documentary. Uh, we re recently did the Agnes Flood documentary. Um, the next one that we have coming up is going to be this Thursday, August 18th, called that Scranton's Championship Season, and we'll be premiering that also at the Circle Drive-In. And basically what I'm leading up to with, with that idea is that filmmaking can be a very important economic business driver in a community. And Ed, you're visiting us here in Florida for a few days, from Florida, visiting us here for a few days. And I think you're interested in our area about so, what we have to offer for potential films down the road. I see great potential here. I see uh, people that are very engaged in film, people who are very passionate with film. Yourself and your documentaries are wonderful. I think there's a lot of opportunities to bring a community here, foster a community, start making both documentaries and narrative-based features here. Um, one, I'm a fan of the seasons. Living in Florida now, we only have summer and summer, summer. Here, you have the fall colors, you have the, the, the winter, you have so many advantages here. I mean, it's summertime right now, and it's beautiful out right now. It's gorgeous. So I think you have a lot of things here. You're close to uh, great places, and you know, you're not too far. What are you, a couple hours from Philadelphia? And um, Allentown's about an hour away. And then you have all these great locations here, the small town feel. Um, it can be used for so many different productions, just beautiful out there. And you're the home of The Office, which is quite possibly, I think it's the most popular show on streaming ever. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. So are you both Office fans? I mean, my son actually turned me on to it. I actually yeah. thought it was a stupid idea, and then I watched it, and I, I got hooked. I think it's absolutely hilarious. Matter of fact, while we were here in your beautiful city, we stopped by today and took a picture with the Dunder Mifflin building, and quite truthfully, that's, that's really exciting for me. So, Ed, what got you into the idea of wanting to become a filmmaker? All right, so when I was a little kid, um, back when you could movie hop, I was very young, shouldn't do it, it's wrong. You should go pay for a movie and go see one movie. But what I would do when I was a kid, it was different. You would go and you'd pay one admission price, and these multiplexes were understaffed and underutilized. 
and I would bring my little clip out from the newspaper that said what time the movies were playing. And I could actually figure out how to go see about eight movies in a day. And we're talking about when movies were movies. I remember one day I was watching Ghostbusters 2, Lethal Weapon 3, uh, a Beverly Hills Cop film, another 48 hours. Uh, uh, Jason, uh, Jason goes to Hell? New York. No, I Jason know. goes to Manhattan. I, I, this is like one summer. Uh, just these awesome, awesome movies. I think another Die Hard movie. And um, I just fell in love with it. I just watched cinema. I loved the story-making process. And as I was growing up, I was like, I want to be involved in that. So I'm going to ask this kind of as a dual question. So did you encourage Michael to get involved in the film business as an actor? Or is it something that he wanted to do? Or he approached you and said, hey, Dad, I'd love to be a part of your movies. Oh, no, I'm absolutely living vicariously through him. There's not a doubt about that, not even for a moment. I was like, listen, you know, my, my, my ability to be a child actor is long gone. I'm about 45 years past that right now. So I was like, you know what? I will have a child actor. And, but I'm not one of those stage dads. What I do is even worse. I write the films, and then I put him in them to star. I'm kind of like the Rob Zombie of independent film. Okay. Except I, it's a not Sherry Moon Zombie. I put my son in the film. So, Michael, how do you feel about that discussion we just had right now with your dad? It's amazing. I'm just so happy. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's great. It's 100% accurate. Keep doing your job, man. Yeah. I appreciate <laughs> but it. But actually, i got to tell you, he was a little, uh, I wouldn't say disinterested in it. He liked the idea, but he didn't realize how much work it would actually be memorizing the lines, hitting your marks, uh, actually having to do acting classes and things of that nature. And then within a couple of years, he works with Gene Snitsky, a former WWE wrestler. He works with an Academy Award nominated actor in Eric Roberts. He works with Michael Pere, who's famous uh, for Eddie and the Cruisers and um, uh, oh, uh, Philadelphia Experiment and uh, Streets of Fire. I mean, just these great classic films of the 80s. The movies that I grew up watching and absolutely loved. I mean, I love these films. And now here's my son sharing screen time with these individuals. So let's ask Michael that question. So what was it like working with Eric Roberts, Michael Perry in the movie The Beast Comes at Midnight? I mean, I don't really stress out that much, but I was a little nervous the first day when I knew I was going to be working with Michael Perry. So, you know, he was really good. He taught me some, he gave me some tips here and there to help me in the scenes and stuff. And Eric Roberts was a, uh, he was an interesting one. That was just an, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think Michael said um, yeah, Eric Roberts was a very uh, physical actor. He wanted to make sure that Michael was in the precise time and moment of those scenes. And uh, there's a little bit of physical interaction between them in the scene. And uh, Michael being a wrestler and a football player and uh, a black belt in jiu-jitsu and he does judo and everything else, he could take a little bit of a bump. So uh, there was some encouragement uh, in the scene for them to have some little bit of physical uh, interaction. And uh, Michael really played on, I think, got him where he needed to be focused for the scene. Would you agree? Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. Well, um, The Beast Comes at Midnight, a movie that was shot in Florida um, last summer, August of 2021. And um, you did something that a lot of independent filmmakers have trouble doing, in which you actually completed the project. I mean, sometimes there's a reputation out there that so many movies don't get completed and everything. So how did it feel the other day to be in New York City, to have this movie that you started a year ago premiere at a film festival in New York City and now to come to Scranton? What were your thoughts? It's an amazing accomplishment. You know, two years ago, we were sitting in the height of the pandemic. Um, COVID-19, everybody's scared. Michael and I are writing a script and we're saying, we're going to make a movie. And uh, we write a werewolf feature. And then within a year, we manage to raise the money. We get a crew together. We're actually actively filming the feature. And then less than a year later, here we are. We're showing it on screens like the Regal Cinemas, the drive-in theater, the biggest screen in, how do I say it, NAPA? Northeastern Pennsylvania. The biggest Pennsylvania. screen in Northeastern Pennsylvania is showing our movie, our labor of love, our passion up on the screen. There's nothing more exciting than that. And then we have a rollout. We're going to be doing all these other independent theaters and drive-in movie theaters. And, you know, I don't think there's a more fulfilling experience than that. It's just amazing. And the fact that I get to share that with my son is, is even more special. Well, I, I think the idea, as I started saying about myself, as far as, like, doing the documentary work, and I'm just such a, a big advocate of our area. I just love our community, northeastern Pennsylvania, whether it's Luzerne, Lackawanna County, Schuylkill County, the Poconos, and things like that. But I think we have so much to offer the film industry. And when you think of the film industry, you think of it as entertainment, but it's also a big economic driver. And I mean, your thoughts on that as a filmmaker who's produced several movies and everything, how, 
What do you see that it can bring to a community, the film industry? Well, I see a very interesting thing. I see you have people that need work. You have people that need high paying jobs. Film jobs are high skill jobs. Um, and it gives people the ability where they could work on an independent feature like ours. They can make some money and then they can actually venture into some of the bigger motion pictures. I think you're creating a community. And I think once you have that, that group of people that get together and make films, like, you know, you look at some people, you look at like a Kevin Smith in New Jersey. You know, he's kind of located to that Red Bank area. I think the Red Bank area, Highlands, that whole part of central Jersey there, has benefited from Kevin Smith being there. You look at the Philadelphia market, M. Night Shyamalan makes films there. So now as you start making films here, or continue to make films here, because you have had big budget films here in the past, and you create that community, you're going to find that individual that stands out that's going to make it their home base, and then that's going to help grow the entire film scene. Because nothing draws people to an area like success. And when you have to have people together working in a community to start having that success. And I would so much agree with you on that. Um, as I started earlier by saying, uh, the recent documentary that I completed called Scranton's Championship Season is based on the 1982 movie that was filmed here in Scranton by the Cannon Group, That Championship Season. Um, it was a, a play that was done by Jason Miller, um, Scranton native, um, won a Pulitzer Prize for it, and then turned it into a film that starred Robert Mitchum, uh, Martin Sheen, Paul Servino, uh, Bruce Dern, just so many celebrities and everything. And kind of as we're sitting here almost 40 years later, my goal is to be able to say we can make Hollywood come back to Scranton, and in this case, the Florida film industry come to Scranton and everything. So I kind of feel like part of what we're trying to do today is to just continue the network development of saying, yes, we can bring the film industry back to northeastern Pennsylvania to make major films and everything. And Kind of that's why I'm just thrilled to have you here and everything. And I know you've only spent a little bit of time in our area, but what are your thoughts on the ability to say, hey, I want to come to Scranton to make a movie with your film company, Showtown American Pictures from Florida? Well, one, it's great to see someone like you with your passion. You, you want to promote filmmakers that want to work here. And even more importantly, you want to promote the actual area here. Um, I made a film not too far from here called 100 Acres of Hell with some former WWE superstars, Gene Snitsky, Samu Enawahi, um, uh, Ernie O'Donnell from Clerks, and we had, we had this great cast. We came to Pennsylvania from New Jersey, and we had a great opportunity here to work here, and people were really passionate about it. See, the one advantage you have, too, like, you know, if you're in Manhattan, and we actually we were in Manhattan the other day, and they were filming the Equalizer on the street there, and people were just walking by, oh, it's the Equalizer. We see this every day in Manhattan. But when you bring a movie to a place like Scranton, Pennsylvania, all the eateries get interested in it. All the local businesses, the lawyers, the people that help service the community, your EMS, your police, everybody kind of wants to be involved in that process. And uh, there's something special about that. I just think it feels very, it's organic. It's not forced. And I think, you know, we discussed the economic benefits of it, but I also look at it, it just brings a sense of pride to a community. Yes. A film is made in your area, you, you come out and you see the premiere, but then you also have just the, the networking opportunities for everyone just to see what a community has and what it has to offer, whether it's through DVD features or just being up there on the big screen. Um, just the community spirit, I think, is so important to rallying behind their area for a film or something. Yeah. Um, I, your thoughts on that? I think it grows beyond that. I think you actually start to have a, a viable arts community. I think you start to develop people who may have never been exposed to acting. You may have the next Lawrence Olivier who may go into working at a, at a, at a water bottling factory because they were never exposed to acting. But now that you have this community here, it's gonna set like a light bulb off over a little kid's head who's really gonna be like, you know what, I love this. And you know, that could be the next superstar. Or you, the next superstar could be sitting right next to you, your son the, Michael. <laughs> I think the next superstar is going, wants to be an attorney. But uh, what he's doing right now is great. And uh, you know, I love him for it and I'm glad that he's really taking to it. Um, you know, but, and if he continues to do it, that's great. But I'll let you talk on all that. Oh, so, yeah. So, Michael, uh, in the movie, The Beast Comes at Midnight, you, you have a young supporting cast in there with yourself as the lead. What was it like working with fellow young adults like yourself in, in a film? Oh, it was fun. We had a lot of fun together. I mean, we were, uh, I don't like TikTok at all, but we did a couple of those. We posted them on TikTok and whatnot. And yeah, it was fun. We had a lot of chemistry. 
on off the set and stuff like that. Yeah. And I just want to say one thing about TikTok. I, I'm pretty good with social media, Facebook, Instagram, some of these things. I didn't realize one of our cast members put a video on TikTok, had like a million views or something. I think so, yeah. Yeah, like, and I don't even know how you can attain that. So just the reach of these social media platforms is amazing. But they had so much fun. The kids got along great. We call them kids. They're young adults. To me, they're kids. Someone 40 to me isn't a kid anymore. But um, they, they had a great time on set. They worked together, and they really had great chemistry. And I think you really see that in the piece. So let's talk a little bit about The Beast Comes at Midnight as a film. So it premiered in Florida, where, where it was shot and everything. We moved it to New York City for a film festival. We moved it to Scranton, Pennsylvania at the drive-in. What is the goal of where you're going to continue to develop this film so that people who are watching this can track it down maybe down the road? Sure. What we're doing right now is we want to be an aggregator of our own content. We want to make sure that we're responsible for putting our film out there, getting it in front of theaters, in front of people that book theaters, and we want to really have uh, the day-to-day -day operational of where our film is being seen. We don't just want somebody to pick it up, a distributor, and then it gets shelved somewhere. And then it pops up on, you know, a big box store for $5 in a bargain bin. If we can avoid that, that's great. And the way you do that is by having greater command and control of your product. We'd rather slowly build our fan base and actually deliver it to the places where we're seeing the most amount of success. Then from there, we can, we can go to DVD, VOD, all the streaming sites, um, and any opportunities that may come our way because every day the film's gathering a little more momentum. So, of course, everyone can go online and read all about this film, The Beast Comes at Midnight, but let's hear from the director and one of the stars. Tell us about the movie itself. What is it about? Um, what's its genre? Things like that. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, the producer, the director's not with us currently, but as a producer, the genre is... It, is, it started out as a traditional horror film, but we knew we were making a horror film that we said, you know, my son being about 13 at the time when we wrote it, and I said, you know, you always hear people, especially on Facebook, my child is 10 years old and I want to watch the first horror movie with him, what should I watch? And you see people put Ghostbusters, Gremlins, Monster Squad, and if you remember, all these movies are 35, sometimes 40 years old now, and I say, you know what, we need that modern movie that people could say, hey, my kid's 10, 12, 13 years old, I want to watch a scary movie with them. And this is, this is what we came up with. And we also wanted to make a movie that harkened back to the old days of horror. The, the, the building up the anticipation, the dun, 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 the creature is exposed. And we, we really like that. I'm, I'm a big fan of the classic Bela Lugosi and Abbott and Costello horror movies. And I think you see a little bit of that in this, a much more modern retelling, but I think you see a little bit of that in this. So Michael, what can you tell us about the movie as far as like, what's the storyline behind it? Sure. Without giving too many details. Uh, okay, yeah, so uh, my character's tough. He's a podcaster. He explores like, uh, sort of like, you know, the interesting parts of uh, Gibson's Hinn and yeah, people start leaving him. It's not looking good for him. So then he's like, all right, I need more viewership. So he tries picking up a story on trying to track a wolf. So he has to go to people. They tell him what to do. And yeah, he has to try to just do some of this wolf. You know? Okay. Yeah. So he's going to try and defeat the werewolf with some friends and help and everything? Yeah. Yeah. So. Let's talk about just the idea of what you want to do in the future then at uh, Showtown American Pictures. Um, I know we've talked about it in different movie ideas and everything. So what are some potential projects that you might be looking at doing? If you could talk to us a little oh, bit Oh, no, that. absolutely. If you were to go on our website, uh, ShowtownAmericanPictures.com, you'll actually see a list of upcoming projects that we currently have in development. And um, what we really like is we loved working with Michael Pere. We enjoyed working with Eric Roberts as well. We enjoyed working with uh, WWE superstars that we've worked with. And now we're very interested in co-producing films and putting together um, you know, property and content with other filmmakers as well. And a um, couple of the films that we have on there, um, you, know, you can look them up. You'll see Honeymoon in Hell, House in the Pines, Scatenado, um, and Bitter Souls, which is another film that we're looking to film down in Florida, um, which Michael will also be in. Um, with a uh, young, I want to make sure I get a model, martial artist, actress, YouTube sensation named I Avery Anna Rose. 
and uh, she's great. She's going to play a girl who was um, bullied, and may she may or may not have died, and her boyfriend brings her back with the use of voodoo. Uh, so kind of very, I like these mytho, mythological stories where stuff's going on. I like ghosts and witches and werewolves and ghouls, and uh, for me, that, that's a lot of fun. So uh, that's kind of what we're looking to do in our Florida stories, and then very other interesting things here in our Pennsylvania stories. I think every area has stories to tell. So with the Halloween season kind of approaching and everything, and this, this film going to be out at different drive-ins, maybe some other theaters, and hopefully down the road we'll be able to stream it and see it on DVD and things like that then. Um, so how do you feel this fits in that marketing concept? I mean, we talked a little bit about it, but there's so many hard R-rated type horror movies, the slasher gore movies and everything. So for an audience that's looking for a little more family friendly, you know, I, we talked a little bit about it, but just what are your thoughts on as, as you know, the dad of a 14-year-old who now has a film to see? How would you tell people to say, come on, you got to come out and support this and turn it into a cult classic like the Goonies or something? Yes, yes. I, I, think, I think the world's changing a little bit. I think people are spending more time with their kids. For a while there, kids were getting really into the games and the video games. I think COVID actually brought families together a little more. And I think now people are taking a little more interest in what their kids do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think if you have a love of film, and you want to foster your children in, in getting involved in film and really watching things, you should watch movies with them. Expose them to the things that you were exposed to as a kid. Like, I'll sit around with Michael and we'll watch Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, all these movies. And we kind of created The Beast Comes at Midnight to be that way. It's kind of a movie you could watch with your kids. And then, when they get older, in the way I do with the Garfield Halloween special, um, now they could show it to their kids. You know, my parents used to watch that with me. 35 years ago, and now I'm watching it with my kids now. So I, we kind of want The Beast Comes at Midnight to be the same thing. Kind of make it a family tradition. It's fun. And we want to make sequels. So the only way we're going to get to make sequels is that people watch the movie, get invested in the characters, and get behind our storyline. Well, I'm going to disagree with you on the Garfield because I'm a Scooby-Doo fan. But anyway, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll still go along with that. Um, but... You know, what I've noticed is there's so many, like, conventions that are happening because I feel like it's just people want to touch Hollywood in some capacity. They want to get that photo with the star. They want to get that autograph or something like that. And filmmaking has that unique ability to bring that, uh, that, that feeling for people, that they have that chance to meet these celebrities and everything. Um, so I know when films are made, the celebrities come out there, but I know we've talked about this idea of trying to get the celebrities into the community um, Gene Snitsky, as an example, the w, former WWE wrestler and everything. Mm -hmm. um, he's been to our area promoting 100 Acres of Hell. He's up here for The Beast Comes at Midnight. What's it like working with these celebrities, whether it's Gene Snitsky, Michael Perry? I know you said a little bit about that, but let's start with Gene Snitsky, let's say. Well, it's very interesting because Gene wrestled in an era that I didn't watch. I grew up in the Hulk Hogan, Roddy Piper, Jimmy Superfly, Snicka, uh, Snooka, rather, uh, King Kong Bundy era of wrestling. So I really didn't have any exposure to Gene Snitsky. Um, so when we were first introduced, I actually kind of had to go online. And just doing that kind of reignited my love of wrestling again. He had this cool character where he just shows up and really doesn't care what anybody thinks of him. He's just a total tough guy. And he's just taking everybody out. He's a big, giant, giant man. And um, you know, then when you meet him, and you start developing intellectual property together, which is what we did with 100 Acres of Hell. We started out with a couple ideas. We weren't sure if it was gonna be a hook murdering slasher, if it was going to be a guy that killed people in a slaughterhouse. And then we said, no, believe it or not, as we were developing this, we saw Gene differently from his WWE character and something that he is quite open about, you know, I could be the good guy. And I gotta tell you, he plays an awesome good guy. But then the hard part, was finding a bad guy that you'd believe could take on a guy who's six foot seven, 300 plus pounds. Luckily, we found Samu in Oahi, who's another monster of a man. And um, so working with these guys is great. They're athletic, they, 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 they love to work, they love to act, they're so animated. I mean, the scenes, the sounds that you hear Jeb Tucker make in 100 Acres of Hell, those guttural sounds, he's making those for real. Like, we didn't have to do sound or post or anything on that. And they're just, they go for it every take. They're throwing each other off of cars. They're throwing each other into houses. They're throwing each other down mountains. And I have all the respect in the world for that. So it's just an amazing experience. 
So, Michael, you were how old when you did 100 Acres of Hell? I think 9 or 10. I think, so yeah, 10. what was yeah. it like? I'm assuming you had a couple scenes with Gene Snitsky. What was that like, uh, oh, well. you know, being a 9, 10-year-old with this 300-pound person? Yeah, I mean, it was scary to stand next to him because I was, like, about this height. And he was, like, what, like 6 foot 8? So, yeah, I mean, working with him was, uh, it was good. It was fun. Just a little uh, scary, I guess. So what do you think of our area? What do you think of northeastern Pennsylvania on your brief visit here this weekend to spend some time promoting the film The Beast Comes at Midnight and working on this partnership relationship of trying to develop movies in northeastern Pennsylvania? What are your thoughts? I, as I go around, I see this beautiful, historic old town. I see beautiful streets that could pass for anywhere USA. They could pass for a cityscape, a, a rural environment. It's really just how you shoot it. You have everything here. You have these beautiful hills. You have just, there's so many things you can work with here. And then all the things that you exposed us to and telling us about with your, your, your park systems and your coal mountains. And your, it just sounds like it's like, oh, and rail train areas. and Just these really amazing, unique things. I think that within an hour of here, if I'm not mistaken, you could pretty much reproduce anything other than a tropical climate. So... Um, you know, I, I think when you see that, you know, I look at something, I see it as a blank canvas that I want to paint. And when I drive through here, it actually gives me ideas for making films. And you can't ask for more than that. That doesn't happen everywhere, but it happens when you drive around Scranton, Pennsylvania. So for our audience that wants to know a little behind the scenes, story you want to share with us about making films, like something that might be a unique story that people go like, oh, that's how they do this or something. Anything stand out, either one of you? I, I know that when you work on independent film, you have to be willing to do it all. I've done everything from running the fog machines to wafting the fog into the shot to running over and grabbing lights. And not because I want to be Superman, but because you have to be able to adapt to these things. I don't have a natural aptitude for running cameras. I could do it, but anybody could hold a camera. Um, making it artistic is a whole different world. Um, but I can run a fog machine better than anybody. I can. So I've learned how to do the things that could be my part to help. And um, I try to put a little touch of that in every, every film that I work on. Michael, any magic of Hollywood story you, you have to share? Mm, I can't think of anything right now. How about just working <laughs> with those celebrities? I mean, you were saying like Eric Roberts, Michael Perret. I mean, do they bring that, that sense of like their history? of what a long careers that they have had, you know? Yeah, you can just see it when you uh, work with them, how professional and, uh, you know, experienced they are, you know. There's confidence. They hit it every take. Like, you know, you work with a, with a Michael Pere, you can give him pages and pages and pages of dialogue. He goes off for five minutes. You hear him talking, you see him walking around, he's gesticulating, and then he comes back and he does two whole pages, and you could have just changed the dialogue. You want to try it a different way. N hits it, nails it every time. I don't have a memory like that. I would really need to study it for like a week straight. And it, that's what amazes me about these actors, especially the actors that act on a very high level. Professionalism, just amazing to watch, really. As a lover of the craft of acting in film, watching these guys is unbelievable. Well, I want to thank both of our guests today, Michael McKeever, Ed McKeever. Thank you for having us. Coming Thanks. up from Florida to visit with us, to spend some time to learn about our city. Um, I recently did a, a brief talk with Mayor Paige Cognetti of Scranton, and I think she's a big believer in wanting to see Scranton become an arts community, a bigger arts community involving the film industry. So I want to see you guys come back up here. Let's make some movies together. Let's make some projects together and everything. Um, just... Let's make things happen in northeastern Pennsylvania. We would love nothing more. Everyone from northeastern Pennsylvania has been so gracious to us, all the way from the theater owners, uh, Circle Drive-In, yourself, the people here, uh, just wonderful, and we'd love to work with everyone. So how do people find out more about Showtime American Pictures? Watching this, they say, oh, we want to know more about The Beast or your future projects. Uh, what, what's the easiest way to find out? The best thing to do is go to ShowtownAmericanPictures.com, and that'll link you to our, our Facebook, our Instagram, all the places we are. And you can actually sign up for our mailing list there. And then as we have interesting things happening, film screenings, uh, new opportunities, if you know people that want to act, if you know people that want to work on crew, have them reach out to us because we like to develop from within. 
So reach out to us. If you send a question to one piece of our social media or our webpage, it goes directly to me and I answer every email that we get. And I think that's very important for our audience to know because we do have so many talented people in our area that maybe want to become that actor, have a small role or maybe a leading role like Michael has developed into a, an actor uh, or just some technical things and everything. So I think you're giving us an opportunity in Northeastern PA, whether it's making a film up in our area, hopefully down the road sometime soon, or having the opportunity to maybe fly down to Florida and be in one of your future films or something like that, or somewhere else on location somewhere. Yes, there's, okay. there's always opportunities. And I think when artists work together and start to create together, there's more opportunities for everyone. And I think the most important thing is to remember there's an independent film scene. And I think sometimes independent filmmakers forget we need to support each other. And if you look at a lot of independent filmmakers' Facebook pages, they'll say, oh, look what Michael Keaton's doing in the new Batman movie. Look what's going on with Avatar 2. Look what's going on with Cobra Kai. And these are all fine, great shows and movies, but take that same invested interest or same vested interest in other independent filmmakers. And other, and other independent filmmakers should do the same thing with other independent filmmakers because that's what's going to help the cream rise to the top. I think you're going up the ladder, there's room, we can all help each other up the ladder, and um, I, I, that's just my piece of advice for the day. Okay. Well, again, I want to thank you both for coming to Scranton, spending time with us, and uh, hopefully developing future films and projects and everything in our area and supporting our great local talent that we have here in Northeastern PA. So thank you for spending time with us here. Thank you for thank having you. us. I'm Bob Savakanis. Thank you for tuning into our program in a nutshell.